How did I get here? I thought I made a clean getaway after that last heist, but the dispatch was right behind me. They tagged me once before I even knew what was happening, but I managed to escape. I thought I could shake him for good this time. He's doing good, too. Moving quiet. I even managed to give the surveillance cars the slip. But in a city this big, there's always witnesses. Oh, that guy? Yeah, he sucks. He's over there. It's just a matter of time before he finds me. You know the worst part? My safe house? The place I've been trying to get to this whole time? It's right there. I can see it. But I've already gone left today. I can't do it again. Oh no! All right, I'm using stun gun. Are you on E6? Uh, yes. Good game. Good game. Hey folks, my name is Shay Parker and this is RTFM, the show where I teach you how to play a game. And today we're learning Run. This is a two-player competitive game of hidden movement, where you'll do your best to either track down the elusive runner or escape the relentless dispatch. You'll have to bluff, deduce, and race against the clock to win. So let's learn how to play. So before we start, I do need to mention some important info. First off, this video was commissioned by Fowers Games, but since I'm just teaching the game and not reviewing it, you don't need to worry about any bias. Second, while I don't expect there to be any rules mistakes, if one or two does manage to sneak through the cracks, I'll be posting corrections using the Klingon subtitles channel. So please turn that on, or at least check the description box below. Now with that out of the way, let's dive in. Run has you playing as either the runner, a cool criminal trying to escape Johnny Law after a big score, or the dispatcher, a helicopter flying super cop whose only goal is to track down this dangerous outlaw and put him to justice. As the runner, your job is to use a hidden movement system to hide your whereabouts from dispatch. There are four gadgets you've hidden at stash points around the town that can help you out with this, and you'll need to pick up at least three of them before making it to one of the two safe houses. If you manage this, you win. But if you're playing dispatch, you aren't going to make it easy on them. You've got five different techniques to suss out their location and take them down. Some of these actions can hit the runner, and if you can hit them twice before they escape, you'll be the winner instead. Now there's a bit more to it than that, but let's set things up first. After deciding who will play which role, each player gets a matching map and screen. This blocks your opponent's view, but it also provides a reminder of everything you need to know in this game, both for your role and the opponent's. You'll place an evidence board to the side where both players can reach it, and this is a dry erase board, so keep a pen nearby as well. There's also a ranking system that serves as both a way to ease you into the game and provides a handicap for new and experienced players. I'll talk about this more later, so all you need to know for now is that on your first game, you'll both play at rank 1, which has a corresponding info card for each role. And after setup, you'll hand that info card to the other player so that they can keep an eye on what you're able to do. From here on out, we have to cover these roles separately, so I'll start with Dispatch. Your player piece is this near-invisible helicopter, which Wonder Woman uses when her jet is in the shop, but for now it's all yours, so place it on the building with a helipad. Then take your five action tiles and place them below the board with the colored side face up, and place these tracking cubes nearby. Because you're at rank 1, you'll choose two of these stash spaces to hold surveillance cars, which you'll place on both players' maps, but I'll talk about how they work when it comes up. You also have a deck of backup cards to help you out, and you'll take the eight cards that correspond to your rank by checking the number in the corner. Reveal one of these cards to find the runner's spawn point on the top left. The runner will place their figure on the matching space on their own map, and you might want to put one of your tracker cubes on the same space on yours. Anyway, shuffle your backup deck, and then you're ready to go. So let's move over to the runner. You've placed your runner on a specific location already, so now you mostly just need to set up your action board. This shows all of your starting move actions, which are all provided by a one-time use token. You've also got a status tile that you should keep nearby with start facing up, and you'll have this exhausted card as well, but hopefully you won't need it. Lastly, take the four gadget tiles and randomly place them face down on the four stash locations on your map. There are advanced gadgets, but we won't be using them for this teach. And that's all for setup, but before we get into the full gameplay, I do want to cover a few important concepts. Like I mentioned, you'll start out at rank 1, and the rules for rank 1 are all I'm going to teach in this video. Once you have those down, learning the rest is easy. I'm also only teaching the basic gadgets and the starting map. There are several double-sided maps to choose from, and each has its own quirks, but for your first game, it's recommended that you play on Cologne. 
After playing a game, if you win, write your name on this rank sheet and place a check next to the rank you played with for your role. The next time you play that role, you should try it on rank two. Keep placing these checks every time you win and keep ranking up every time you make it to the next level. Those cards I mentioned earlier will tell you all you need to know to play at your current rank, but they aren't too different from each other. Anyway, let's talk about the game itself. The runner will go first and takes two actions, but from then on you'll go back and forth playing one action at a time until the runner either escapes or is defeated. The runner takes actions by choosing a tile and moving their figure in the corresponding direction, then placing the tile either face up or face down on the evidence sheet, depending on whether it was a noisy or silent move. Dispatch uses this information, as well as their own actions, to hunt down the runner. However, when they use an action, they'll have to flip over their tile only flipping them back if they use all five, or take an entire turn to do just that. Each player will have to be clever about their movements, devious even, if they want to succeed. So let's go in depth on each roll, starting with the runner. Job went south and you're on the run. Dispatch is on your tail, but you've spent years stashing helpful gadgets around the city. If you can pick up three of them and make it to the safe house, you'll be free as a bird. But there's a problem. You know they're watching closely, so you can't be too predictable, which means you can never make the same move twice. So let's see how that all actually works. On the runner's turn, you will choose one of your tiles, either a movement tile or, if you've picked any up, a gadget. The vast majority of the time, you'll only take one action on your turn. But on the first turn of the game, and then after the first time you get hit, you'll take two consecutive actions. Anyway, after choosing a tile, you move your figure in the corresponding direction and place the tile on the evidence board. If it was a silent move, this will have a question mark on the back and you'll place it face down. All other tiles must be placed face up, but as we'll see, that doesn't mean they know exactly what you did. Let's start with the silent moves and talk about some basic movement rules as well. For the most part, these orthogonal and diagonal moves are pretty self-explanatory. You move one space in that direction. However, with Dispatch at rank 1, you'll also have to tell them whether it was an orthogonal or diagonal move as you place the tile on evidence. Again though, these moves are silent, so the tile is placed face down. The rest of the moves are noisy, and these include wilds and sprints. When you take a wild move, you can go either orthogonally or diagonally, depending on the tile. But all that Dispatch knows is that you used that wild, not which way you went. Similarly, when you sprint, you can move as far in that direction as you want, minimum one space, but you only tell dispatch the direction, not the distance. And while most movement is as simple as that, there are a few important things to know. There's some obvious stuff, like you can't go off the edge of the map, but then there's less obvious stuff, like how buildings work. See, every city has buildings in it, that's kind of just how cities work, and if you want to move onto a building space, you have to climb up one of these fire escape ladders. In order to do this, you must be next to one and play the corresponding action. So here I would need to play a left move. The orthogonal wild would also work here, but you can't sprint up a ladder. Once you're on top of a building, however, getting off of it doesn't have special rules, and you can use any action to do so. And lastly, when buildings are diagonally adjacent, you can squeeze between them or hop from one to another using normal movement rules. Next, let's talk about gadgets. First off, you need to pick some up, and you'll do that by ending your movement on a space with a gadget. Pick it up and place it on your board. You'll get to see what it is, but don't tell dispatch. You need to pick up three of these before you can escape, but you don't need to hold on to them. See, each gadget provides a special movement ability, and they're pretty helpful. The smoke bomb lets you move to any adjacent space following normal movement rules, so it can take you up a ladder, but you can't scale the side of a building. The jetpack, on the other hand, lets you move one or two spaces in a straight line, and you can jump onto or over buildings, because it's a jetpack. Next we've got the crowbar, which lets you break into a building. You need to be orthogonally adjacent to one, and then you'll place your figure on any other space orthogonally adjacent to the building. Also, if multiple building spaces are connected like this, that makes them a complex, extending the reach of this item. So in this example, all of these are viable exit spaces. And lastly, there's the hook. This lets you move up to two spaces orthogonally or one space diagonally, but a building has to be involved. You can climb up a building, jump off of one, or go from rooftop to rooftop, but you can't go from flat surface to flat surface. It helps to imagine your Batman. I do that as often as possible, highly recommend it. So that's how the gadgets work, but using them is pretty flashy, so when you place them on the evidence board, they'll go face up. 
Dispatch won't know exactly how you used it, but they will know what you used. Anyway, like I said, after you've picked up your third gadget, all you need to do to win is make it to one of the two safe houses. But there are a few things standing in your way. First off, while Dispatch is playing at rank 1, there are surveillance cars placed at two of your stash points. When you leave a space with a surveillance car, you must tell Dispatch that you've done so and which space it was, though sprinting through a surveillance space will not activate it. Once a car has been triggered, both players remove it from their board. Of course, that's not the only way the Dispatch is looking for you. They've also got actions that can determine your location, and if those fail, they've got backup, a small deck of cards that helps them out in various ways. All you need to know about it is that they occasionally call on the help of witnesses, these people on the map that you might want to avoid, and that these cards get stronger the more Dispatch draws them or the more gadgets you use, so keep that in mind. Anyway, when Dispatch thinks they know where you are, some of their actions can hit you. And if they do, the first time this happens, you're alright. In fact, you'll get a boost of adrenaline and take two consecutive turns after that. But if you get hit a second time, you get knocked out, and the game is over. You didn't win. And the last thing to talk about is becoming exhausted. If you can't or don't want to use any of your remaining actions, you become exhausted. Now, some of this is about to sound kind of okay, so I need to stress up front that most of the time you don't want this to happen. Anyway, first you flip your player board, scattering any remaining movement tokens to the wind. You don't need them where you're going. Next, you would flip your status marker to the hit side without gaining the extra moves, but for rank 1 you skip this step. Give dispatch the exhausted cards, they know what's up, and from now on you can only walk. You move one space at a time, orthogonally or diagonally, and you can repeat moves you've done before, but you need to tell Dispatch which direction you moved each time you do it. Also, instead of winning immediately when you reach a safe house, you now need to start your turn on one, meaning Dispatch has one last turn to take you out. Again, it is a lot harder to win when you're exhausted. Try not to let it happen. But that's all you need to know to play as the runner, so let's move on to Dispatch next. dangerous criminal on the loose and only a mastermind like you can bring them in. They may be elusive, but you've got all the clues in front of you and you're going to track them down no matter what it takes. There's just one problem. You kind of forgot to charge all your gear, so now you're doing that thing where you swap your one charging cable between devices so you get like five minutes of battery life before it dies again. It'll be fine. You'll make it work. So. As dispatch, you'll be using what your opponent tells you, as well as applying various search and attack techniques to find and hit the runner. Hit them twice before they escape, and you win. So let's see how that works. On your turn, you may move, and you must take one action. And you can choose the order of that. When you move, you ignore map features, so you don't need to worry about rooftops, and you can move as far as you want in a straight line, orthogonally or diagonally. You're basically a queen in chess, just, you know, with rotors. And most importantly, you don't announce your move to the runner. You'd think they'd be able to hear you coming, but this is a stealth helicopter. stealth -icopter. TM. So, moving is optional, but taking an action is mandatory, and there are five actions to take. Each time you take an action, you flip the tile over, making it unusable until it's refreshed, which can happen in two ways. Either you use all five actions, after which they'll automatically flip face up, or you can skip your entire turn to recharge, flipping up all used actions. So, what do they do? First off, you've got your scans, and these will target the entire row or column that you're in. You announce this to the runner, and they have to truthfully tell you whether or not they are also in that row or column, but not their exact position. The floodlight targets the helicopter's space plus the next two spaces in an orthogonal line, and this illuminates those spaces, meaning that if the runner is in there, they must tell you their exact location. And lastly, we have the hitting actions. Stun Gun targets any single space in your row or column, and if the runner's in that space, they must announce it and take one hit. Sonic Blast, on the other hand, targets the helicopter's space and one orthogonally adjacent space. If this hits the runner, they must tell you, but they don't reveal their location. And as a reminder, after the first time you hit the runner, they'll take two consecutive turns. Of course, you're probably not going to be spot on every time, and if the runner wasn't in any of the spaces targeted by your action, you get to call in some backup. When this happens, you draw and reveal a backup card, which will help you out in various ways. You'll choose one of the three options, but the second and third actions have prerequisites. 
In order to pick one of these, the runner must have used at least one or two gadgets already, or you must have at least three or six backup cards in your discard pile when you draw it. Many of these actions will be similar to your own or call in witnesses. We've mentioned these before, they're the little guys on the map with their phones out, and they're keeping an eye on their own space and each space the dotted line touches. These actions are all pretty self-explanatory, with a few clarifications that you can find on the back of the rulebook. And lastly, I want to talk about what you'll do with all the information you're receiving. See, most of the time you'll be getting incomplete pictures of the runner's whereabouts, so you'll want to keep track of it. There are three main ways to do this. Placing tracking cubes, writing on the evidence board, and writing on the runner's rank card. There's no rules for this, so you can do it however you like, but here's an example of how you might use these tools. Let's say the runner starts on space 8. On the first turn, they get two actions, so they run left and then make a silent move. Because you're rank 1, they must tell you whether it was orthogonal or diagonal, and they say diagonal. The run could have left them in any of these spaces, but a diagonal move won't get them up the building, so this space is impossible. You can infer that the runner must be in one of these three spaces, and place cubes there. You cross out the left run and place dots next to the two diagonal moves that they might have used. On the evidence board, you make a note next to the silent move about what it could have been, which will help build a timeline of events after a few more moves. And with that, you now know all you need to know to play run. There are a few advanced maps, gadgets, and of course the higher ranks, but now that you know the basics, you should have no problem learning each new step as it comes up. Of course, if you have any questions that the rulebook doesn't answer, there is an official FAQ, and I post a link to that in the description box below. I want to thank Fowers Games for commissioning this video, and thanks to all of you for watching it. Now, if you'll excuse me, there's been a helicopter hovering over my apartment for a little while now, and uh, I think it's a stun gun is fully charged, so um, bye!